I'm Yvonne Schwab, ACG Silicon Valley CEO. As many of you already know, ACG is, is the leading business-to-business -business networking organization in Silicon Valley, providing connections, thought leadership, and enabling personal and organizational growth. ACG offers an array of networking opportunities with almost 15,000 members in 59 chapters across the world. ACG provides local connections with a global reach. We're offering a variety of virtual events in the coming months and invite you to visit our website, acgsv.org to see the full calendar, including a discussion on SPACs and cybersecurity, as well as several fun networking events with other ACG chapters and a virtual wine tasting. If you have any questions regarding ACG Silicon Valley, I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you and discuss your possible involvement with our 36-year-old chapter in detail. My door is always open for you. Now we're thrilled to offer you today's event, which would not have been possible without our sponsor, QuickLogic, which develops low power multi-core semiconductor platforms and intellectual property for artificial intelligence, voice and sensor processing. So thank you. To continue the discussion, you will receive an invitation to join our LinkedIn group, which we created for all participants. During the discussion, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. We will be monitoring the questions as they come in. Now let's get started. First, I would like to introduce you to Brian Faith, panelist and moderator for today's event. Brian has been president and CEO of QuickLogic since 2016 and has held a variety of leadership positions in sales, marketing, and engineering over the, 20, over the past 20 plus years. Brian is currently a board director of the Global Semiconductor Alliance, holds a BS degree in computer engineering from Santa Clara University, and was an adjunct lecturer at Santa Clara University for programmable, programmable logic courses. Let's not forget that he's also a supporter of ACG Silicon Valley. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Brian. Brian? Thanks, Yvonne, and uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. I'm really happy and excited to be moderating this panel of distinguished panelists on uh, what I think we can all agree is a very hot topic uh, today, whether we like it or not. Uh, the purpose of this panel, as the title shows, is to talk about AI screening solutions um, and how we can protect those at, at risk, in fact, most at risk uh, during this pandemic. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, you can have questions that you submit in the chat um, that we will try to address. Some people sent questions beforehand that we're going to try to incorporate into the, the discussion. And I also want to say that we are going to incorporate some, uh, hopefully a lot of interaction from the audience today, including some polling questions in the early going of the panel um, that we'll use to try to help frame some of the discussion points as well. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to actually start with the first polling question. And that is, uh, it's going to be related to if you understand or have an idea of what percentage of people get infected with the virus are actually asymptomatic. Uh, that polling question probably just popped up down your window, so go ahead and answer that. It'll be interesting to see what people are thinking about that while we go and start introducing the panelists. So the first uh, panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, Brian Wisk of Ark Investments. Hi, I'm Brian, um, founder of Arc. Uh, we've been working together with everybody here on this consortium on uh, really focusing on on ways that we can find an interim solution uh, while we're waiting for a vaccine and widespread testing and other things to come uh, to bear. So um, working with our partners at QuickLogic, Skywater, and LA Semi, we've been able to um, develop what we think is a low-cost uh, symptomatic surveillance uh, device that we can sort of see temperature spikes in the population. So that's what I'll be uh, talking about today. Thanks, Brian. Uh, next panelist is Mark Treat from Upward Health. Mark, could you introduce yourself, please? Apologies, chronic mute disorder here. Um, my name is Mark Treat. I'm, I'm with Upward Health. Uh, Upward Health is a um, uh, in-home primary care provider. We use telemedicine and 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 uh, facilitate virtual visits and deliver complex care into the home. 
Um, we've recently launched a program called COVID Care at Home, which is a comprehensive end-to-end -end COVID solution. It starts with the surveillance that Brian was just mentioning, uh, which is uh, you know, ongoing surveillance of at-risk populations. But then from there, we can do evaluations, we can issue physician orders, we do in-home testing, and we do in-home treatment, which uh, requires a you know, very close monitoring of patients who may have tested positive. Uh, so we do, we try to keep people out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, and treat them at home uh, safely. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And and uh, we can close off, I think, that first polling question while we're introducing the rest of the panelists. Um, another series of questions is going to pop up here. And uh, one of them is going to be related to uh, what your primary strategy is for maintaining continuity of operations through the pandemic. It'll give you some choices, be it vaccines, testing, or surveillance, or none. And then there'll be a series of questions after that on the, what you view the efficacy of those various options would be. Uh, so while those polling questions are, are popping up, uh, we'll turn it over to our next uh, person to be introduced, which is Mike Ward of Linear Asics. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Ward, founder and CEO of LA Semiconductor. We've been working for quite a long time now with Brian Whisk and Brian Faith, uh, both um, trying to develop custom uh, ASIC solutions or custom sensor solutions for this COVID pandemic. Uh, we were actually in the middle of doing uh, custom silicon for some other um, uh, applications when we kind of started to pivot just to, to uh, uh, resolve some of these solutions for COVID-19 and I think we've been pretty successful. So um, I think we're very happy to be part of this group and uh, well, we love the cause. Thanks, Mike. All right, next sure. up on the panel is uh, Mark Latecki of Skywater. Mark. Hey, Brian, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mark Latecki. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Skywater. Uh, I'm responsible for really our corporate and strategic marketing to connect with customers and carry that engagement with customers all the way through to the point where we're delivering their valuable solutions enabling their success. Um, and, and really, Skywater is, uh, is pretty unique. Uh, we're uh, a US owned and US located independent technology foundry, uh, really the only one that is in his existence. Uh, we're differentiated really by combining um, agile uh, development as well as quality volume manufacturing, which really means that we co-create with our customers to create custom technology solutions for the future. And then we move that into manufacturing. So as, as Mike Ward said, uh, they're really designing and developing computer chips and, and solutions. Skywater becomes the manufacturer of those solutions for our partners like uh, LA. It's important to note that we, um, we are a trusted uh, IP uh, facility. So basically we are, we're secure. We're able to uh, really provide customers with very secure solutions with manufacturing in the US and we can effectively develop uh, highly differentiated technologies to rapidly get them uh, to market. So ultimately, uh, with the topic at, at hand, uh, we'll talk a lot about the sensor solution. Uh, we're basically the manufacturer of the actual temperature sensor used in, in the device that will be, uh, the solution we'll be talking about today. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so we've seen sort of the, the tip of the spear with with ARC and uh, Upward Health, and now the semiconductor guys introducing themselves with Linear ASICs and Skywater. Let's move on to sort of the, uh, the blend of research and software and AI. Uh, next up to be introduced is Dr. Imran of AI for Life. And you're on mute, Dr. L Dr. Imran. Hi, Brian, and thank you very much. Um, my name is Imran, and I'm founder of uh, AI for Life. And uh, AI for Life is a startup focused on uh, exploiting the combination of artificial intelligence and sensing and communication technologies for detecting, uh, non-intrusively detecting respiratory and non-respiratory diseases. And in the context of this particular consortium, um, we are working on a cuff-based diagnosis of COVID-19 for which we have a prototype, uh, which we are very excited about, which can, uh, with about 80% accuracy, can detect uh, presence of COVID-19 infection from cough sound. And uh, very happy to be part of this team and 
looking forward to the, this panel. Thanks, Dr. Imran. Thank you. All right, and uh, last but not least, Chris Rogers of Sensimal. Uh, good morning, thanks, Brian. Um, so Sensimal is a, a software company that's focused on providing uh, development tools for uh, AI at the edge. Uh, you know, our origins came out over eight years ago as a uh, intact uh, software development tools team at Intel. Uh, we were um, uh, a spin out as of 2017 and uh, have focused on being a uh, agnostic, uh, platform agnostic uh, tools provider to take uh, complicated AI algorithms out of the cloud and deploy them at the edge. Uh, the advantage of edge being that uh, you get uh, near real-time response, uh, you get the benefits of security and privacy of not sending lots of uh, sensitive data over the internet, and uh, you have the obvious uh, robustness of a solution that can be you know, self-contained within the device itself. So. Uh, for those reasons, we've had a lot of uh, you know, benefits in industrial and commercial and uh, uh, consumer IoT applications. And our um, contribution in uh, this consortium is obviously with the need for screening and the use of multiple sensor technologies that are available to be able to do uh, 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 predictive analytics uh, prior to diagnostic testing, uh, it's important to be able to deploy solutions where you can get that kind of performance at the edge. Uh, so uh, our focus is on taking those available measures that we're getting from this consortium, the audio data, uh, the various uh, biometrics that are available for screening and be able to deploy a solution that can efficiently analyze in real time uh, on IoT edge screening devices and smartphone applications. Thanks, Chris. All right, so that's the panelists for today. Um, let's let's get into this. So I think just to provide some context, I think if we were to be doing this type of a webinar or a panel discussion uh, a year ago, we'd all be in our offices and and uh, life would be sort of considered as normal. Um, now it's sort of apropos that it's it's the end of summer. Kids are supposed to be going back to school. There's different situations around the country for that. I'm sure everybody or a lot of people on this uh, call are trying to wrestle with what they do with that while they still balance their work and their family. So there's a lot of uncertainty um, for myself included. And I'm, I guess that's sort of where the first question goes here, which I'd like to direct to, uh, to Brian and to Mark. Um, how do we transition from the shelter in place back to the new normal, if you want to call it that? Yeah, maybe Brian, you could go back to that slide at the top of the deck um, that shows sort of the early warning, because I think that's kind of the that was the aha moment for myself. Um, I think it's the next, yeah, there we go. So th this is, um, uh, so Mark Treat over at Upward Health introduced ARC to Brown uh, early on as we were looking for ways that this could be significant. This is a study that was conducted in um, conjunction with the VA and nursing homes. And I think the, the main thing that I want to point out is this, uh, red line here were, who were the um, SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, patients, 73% you know, never hit the CDC threshold of 38 degrees Celsius, which is uh, 100, 104 degrees or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So until people you know, are hearing about this and saying, well, most people are asymptomatic, they're not realizing that something is going on in your body. Your body is reacting to this virus. It just may not react as violently as, as, as someone else. And it depends on age, it depends on comorbidities. But if we can get in a six to eight day head start on when those symptoms start to show up, that's a real advantage that's going to save lives. So we've just been sort of focused on how to operationalize this and to do that at scale. And that's where Skywater and Linear ASIC and having the volume and the low cost solution uh, allow us to do this. Um, and whether that's schools, whether that's people returning to offices or just COVID fatigue, this isn't, you know, the perfect silver bullet, but it's a step in the right direction where we can start playing offense instead of where we are today, which is just let's, let's hole up and play defense until there's a vaccine. So Mark, I don't know if you wanted to 
Mark Treat, if you wanted to add to that um, with what Upward is doing. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And just, just uh, you know, looking at this data, the, the point zero in the middle there is when people became noticeably symptomatic and got tested. Yep. And the reason that's important is uh, the current thinking by most leading clinicians is that you start shedding the disease or you become contagious or infectious somewhere between one and three days before that point zero. And the key point you know, to realize here is that through very, very accurate temperature reading, um, you can start to see uh, indications that somebody's at risk, you know, six to eight days prior to. So that, that implies that it might be possible to identify individuals who are at risk before they become infectious, which clearly, um, you know, our next phase that we're working with Brian and this team on is to prove that we can actually use the data to slow or stop the spread of the disease in nursing homes and other, um, you know, high risk areas with vulnerable patient populations. So it's, it's very, this, this data really shows great promise and it could be significant. Um, the other couple things I just mentioned about the data that, that we've learned from the, uh, the team who, who conducted the study and it's now published and peer reviewed um, is that the prediction's about 90% accurate, which is not good enough for somebody to be diagnosed with COVID, it's really indicating that um, people have a temperature or they're starting, their immune system starting to kick in. It doesn't necessarily mean it's COVID, it means you're at risk. So there are other interventions like testing and evaluations that we plan to do very rapidly by using um, you know, technology to, to get, get into it. You're gonna have some false positives for COVID but the key point is um, the data suggests that you should be able to identify um, uh, at least 90% of the patients who do have COVID that early. So that, that to me is a, a significant breakthrough because I think that's greater than the variation that you get in, in other methods like testing, et cetera. Um, and this is just one feature, keep in mind too, to Mark's point. So, you know, going to, Sensimol and AI for Life and all the stuff that we're doing with the data science, as we add stuff like cough data or heart rate variability or any of these other features that um, uh, add resolution, the hope is we can get even more uh, sensitive with, with, with the screening process. This is just sort of the first pass uh, and what, you know, in everything we're trying to do, this is another important point. We're trying to do this for, for at, a, at the lowest cost possible. We view this as kind of a hack. Uh, most, you know, there are plenty of wearable devices out there that are $300, but just you just can't get them out into the population at scale. So being able to do the AI, you know, on device at the edge with a very cheap sensor uh, is kind of like the, the, you know, lowest common denominator we could come up with. Uh, and then, you know, the process now is to prove that out, that this could actually be effective. A couple other advantages to this approach too, by having a patch, you're taking multiple readings a day, because uh, one of the things that we learned from the data is a single reading uh, typically is fairly worthless. You really want to look at the variation of someone's baseline over time, because temperature varies throughout the day. Um, and number two is that the temperature reading is consistently in the same location. Um, so you're, you're getting um, quality data inputs versus other, you know, other approaches. So we think there's a lot of hope um, and promise here. And over the next few months, we think we're going to be able to, you know, show that we can really move the needle. Yeah, that's, thanks for the introduction on that, guys. And I think that the notion that you're personalizing it for the individual is, is uh, it makes a lot of sense. It gives me a little bit more comfort because I know even my own kids, their temperature tends to run hot or cold individually, even though they're not sick. So I could see the applicability there. And I think it's, it's inspirational for me that technology is being applied to this. As a former engineer, I love that. Um, so you guys talked about the wearables and the applications that um, maybe for the, the semiconductor guys on this call, um, what are some things that you guys are doing towards contributing to this? And is this recent push towards domestic sourcing, is that helping or hindering this whole initiative? Absolutely, I can uh, speak to that some. I can say what I find interesting is really, um, you know, Skywater's business model has really always been to kind of partner with 
people like Mike Ward, chip designers, and our customers to, to really help develop their solutions. So that partnering and, and a lot of the inspiration that you're, you're you know, feeling from how people are reacting and, and changing uh, with respect to the pandemic is, is really the, the model we already had in place, but it enabled us to quickly pivot on some technology and some designs that were happening for other markets and other reasons. Uh, other applications, and then apply those to um, this specific, you know, temperature sensing uh, application. And so, seeing that come to life, and and seeing that pivot, and how quickly uh, we were able to respond and iterate, um, doing that domestically is extremely important because we're able to iterate through technology solutions much faster. Uh, by being co-located in the, in the U.S. and working with U.S.-based partners. So that certainly uh, has been a, a helpful factor from that as well. You know, one of the, uh, looking for the upside, one of the potential upsides of the pandemic from a communications perspective anyway, is, is it enables us to move quicker with those partners because we aren't waiting for live meetings. We aren't waiting to get on an airplane and go have face-to-face -face meetings. So actually we're moving much faster from that perspective as, perspective as well. And I really think this is going to open the doors for uh, expansion of wearable devices, sensors, et cetera, that um, people are now more open to putting a patch on themselves, knowing that it's a secure communication. It's only speaking, you know, to their phone or to their device or whatever it may be. Um, but so there's a lot going on from that perspective. Thanks, Mark. Mike, how yep. about you? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Linear ASICs uh, and, and our uh, LA Semiconductor is our um, uh, ASSP um, sort of marketing uh, company. We have been working with Skywater for about a year and a half on a full sprint to bring some of the products we've been making um, in Asia and other parts of the world into a domestic supply chain. So uh, we had several big customers in power management uh, and in uh, industrial and, and other uh, commercial applications who wanted a dedicated supply chain domestically. So we have been basically designing new products and, and pulling a lot of things into the um, fabrication facility at Skywater. So we were kind of in the middle of that. And then in early March uh, and then into April, we kept getting incoming calls through, uh, you know, various different avenues, including some of Brian Whisk's um, partners and, uh, uh, and, and people that they work with for um, temperature sensors that were coming from uh, Asia and China. And a lot of companies just weren't able to get their hands on a supply of these uh, sensors for digital thermometers and other electronic devices that go into healthcare. So um, what we saw is an opportunity to take um, some very specific things we had been working on with Skywater and pivot them to, you know, basically help with the, the pandemic and, and, come up with this solution, which was really uh, I, one of the most elegant, low cost solutions for um, a healthcare sensor uh, that I've seen employed. So, um, you know, hats off to the medical guys and the, and the healthcare guys for um, taking advantage of, of this technology. And, and we've been able to sort of react quickly. And so now that we have supply chain, you know, fully US and we're gearing up for this, we can, you know, very quickly create millions of devices that we can employ into uh, US-based uh, uh, institutions like Brown and so forth. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I think, yeah, the, the semiconductor industry is mature enough that we can definitely see these things getting manufactured at scale, uh, no problem. That's, uh, that's fundamental. And it's good to see that it's gonna be so low cost because I don't wanna be buying multi-hundred dollar watches for my kids. Uh, that would be destroyed in a week. Um, I think ultimately with these devices, there's, there has to be software on top of those devices and there has to be intelligence on top of those because sensors create data, but how you turn data into meaningful, actionable information is key. Software is involved in that. And um, I think that, that's the next question I'd like to pose to Dr. Imran and Chris on the software side is how, how do you make best use of these, the sensor data and actually turn it into actionable information? Yeah. And Go ahead, Ollie. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was going to suggest, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so I, I tend to view everything as uh, mechanical systems. Uh, uh, our 
predominant uh, market has been in industrial sensing. So uh, you, in that case, you have a lot of heterogeneous sensor sources that can be things that are very slow varying to things that are extremely dynamic sensor uh, inputs, uh, like vibration sensing combined with uh, a temperature of a machine. Um, if we think of our bodies as, as a mechanical system, in a sense, the kind of data that we have available from the screening mechanisms is similar, right? Uh, we've got temperature sensing, as uh, Brian was describing, where I might have a couple of samples a day, or uh, at most, maybe every hour. Uh, but uh, that combined with things like pulse ox oximetry, respiratory rate, and then extremely dynamic sensor data from things like uh, an acoustic measurement of a cough, right, where I'm looking for an audible characteristic uh, in a one second sample. And then combining all of that into a model that gives me sort of a best predictive based on all the sensor data that's available to me. Um, you know, requires things like ensemble models that can deal with that widely disparate type of input data. And you know, the other aspect of being able to do that at the edge device frees me from the uh, you know, sort of dependency on having a reliable network connection. You know, these are going to be deployed, as we see it, in all kinds of environments that can be challenging. It might be a food processing plant in a remote location. It could be a healthcare facility. Um, and, um, you know, being able to provide real-time responsiveness by taking those kind of algorithms, deploy them on the edge, get a real-time response while maintaining the, the, the privacy of you know, user data for sensitive uh, measures is, uh, you know, what we're all about. We do that in the industrial space. We see this as an, a, a great opportunity to be able to contribute uh, to, to address this challenge. Uh, yeah, Ali. Uh, if you can add to that. Yes, so, um, yes, we, have, we can actually not only detect some signal of the infectious diseases, such as uh, COVID-19 infection, but other respiratory diseases from the cough sound, the same way we can actually detect the, whether the guitar is made of a certain type of wood um, by looking at the tone. Similarly, there are other, other biomarkers, for example, blood oxygen saturation level or pulse rate or even uh, mean arterial pressure or system, systematic uh, vascular resistance. These are biomarkers which can be detected non-invasively and with a very cheap sensor, including sweat level. And they do have uh, intrinsic uh, information which can be used to detect infectious diseases, including COVID-19. A uh, lot in advance. So, and then machine learning, including deep learning, can be used to detect that if we have access to wireless uh, connection. But if we don't have access to wireless connection, then as Chris pointed out, we can do it on the edge by using a lighter version of the machine learning, and for example, using distilled deep learning or uh, other lighter uh, machine learning algorithms. So, it can be a combination where we, if we have a, a high and com computational complexity available in our smartphone device. And then we can use that, or if we don't have ac access to a expensive smartphone device, then we can take advantage of wireless connectivity. And then you use a combination of easily measurable biomarkers such as cough sound, acoustic sounds, and sweat level and temperature. And then it can lead to a highly accurate early detection and warning system for infections like uh, COVID-19 based infection. Thanks Dr. Imran and Chris. Um, I think you guys did a great job of giving your individual contributions to this overall solution and I think maybe as I listen to this maybe Brian we could go back to you and Mark and you can sort of take us back to the beginning of how this uh, how this actually looks in terms of rolling it out. Um, yeah I mean I think there's one thing that's not widely understood about this disease. It's really a vascular disease, uh, whereas, you know, early on people thought this is, you know, a respiratory illness like pneumonia. And um, the way that coronavirus really uh, systemically affects your body, um, you know, shows up in, in heat. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of the first heads up, the first tip you get. And the reason that that's so significant is, you know, everybody understands 
the incredible push for a vaccine and how the entire world's coming together and every you know top pharmaceutical company on the planet is 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 pushing to get this done but on the other side is the therapeutic side which is uh, you know, if we have a, a situation like HIV AIDS, where you have to have a, you never get a vaccine, you have to have a cocktail of therapeutics. How early you can detect this is going to be really significant in delivering those therapeutics uh, to people when it has the biggest impact, unlike a vaccine. So I think in the implementation of this and rolling this out, at nursing homes, we're, we're starting with the highest risk sort of ground zero for coronavirus in this country where in worldwide, where 50% of the fatalities have been um, and saying that if we can just sort of replicate what Brown did. And by the way, Brown was able to get a 30 to 50% reduction in the outbreaks in Rhode Island, in these Rhode Island facilities in April and May because of this work. So if we can just replicate that with a wireless device, um, we'll, 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 we'll have done something. Uh, and then what the therapeutic companies like the Amtons and Gileads and Regenerons of the world do uh, to follow up with that, I think is what we're gonna see over the next two to three months, especially going into flu season. I think, Brian, I think that, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, exactly right, Brian. And you know, our, the current understanding, and just to speak, I'm not a clinician, but we talk a lot to clinicians all day long, um, is that, that the virus binds through the ACE2 uh, receptor in your intestines and transmits through the bloodstream, as Brian just said. Um, and what that does is it causes a coagulation in the lungs on the surface of the lungs, which is why you have a unique cough sound um, for COVID versus, say, a, pneumatic, a pneumonia infection or bronchitis or something like that. So it's really, uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to, you know, merge the data from temperature, cough, and other sources to, to look at it. Um, as, as we started to think about how this is going to be deployed, the idea that you're doing surveillance across all of the people in a care setting or an employer setting um, doesn't really matter. But if you can control the setting and control that access to that setting is only through people who are being surveilled, you're able to you know, significantly reduce what's called the r not. Um, I think a lot of people know what that is, but that's the number of people an individual infects once you've been infected. And there's different, different uh, numbers being thrown around, but I think the current thinking is that the r not for COVID is somewhere between four and six for a general population. In nursing homes, it's 15. If we can get the R not down to less than one, the disease will extinguish itself and it will stop spreading. Um, so, you know, what we're going to be doing as we go forward here is to deploy this in controlled settings where we can monitor people who um, at risk vulnerable uh, individuals are getting in contact with, take early interventions, isolate PPE, et cetera, test, and try to, you know, significantly move the needle. And whether it's a nursing home or somebody you earlier used a food processing plant, um, you know, you have certain essential uh, workers where the idea of doing this kind of surveillance um, is really critical. And I'm going to defer to others to chime in on it. But one of the other things that you can do is you can do it in a way that's not only HIPAA compliant, but protects the privacy of the patient in a way where it's more, do you have access, yes or no? We're not saying you're sick or not. Um, so you can really, you can make it an access control uh, type program. I see. Yeah, Brian, maybe we could go back to you and you could actually show it again. Um, we only briefly got to see you showing that. Yeah, I mean, a um, couple of questions that I see coming through the chat before I just show what I'm wearing, because I think one of the question, you know, relates but just talking about pre-existing lung conditions and detection and all and, and all of that, I think it's important to really stress that we're not, our goal with this consortium is to not give you a magic device, you know, like the tricoder or something that says, hey, you have COVID, you know, and then you replace the testing that's there. Um, the cough stuff 
can, uh, you know, if you go and read Dr. Imran's paper, you, you do see a very distinct pattern that uh, for coronavirus patients relative to people who had bronchitis or other uh, lung conditions. Um, so that was really, really interesting. And I don't know if that's, you know, to, to Mark's uh, hypothesis to see uh, um, uh, if that's related to the microclots in the lungs. But, you know, we, we, what we really want to accomplish with this is getting this early and, um, and getting it into the population at scale. That's our main, main goal. And that's why having a, 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 a cheap device, this, this sensor, I'm, I'm wearing a, one of the sensors here, um, you know, with this app, you can see sort of, you can sort of control the reading and see your entire history um, throughout the day uh, on the phone. And, you know, the sensor costs less than $5 with stuff that, you know, has gone on at the NBA or other, these other solutions, you're looking at two to three hundred dollar devices. So there's there, there's even if they, those devices were available at scale, we're not we don't have enough time to get those into the population. Not to take anything away from what what those companies are doing, it's great. Um, but you know the goal is to have this population health surveillance system uh, so that we can get get the spread and kind of control the spread um, while we're waiting for this vaccine. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, so I guess uh, one thing that I'm thinking of is that, uh, first of all, I'd love to adopt this kind of a solution in our office as we transition back into the office. And I'm wondering if, if you guys uh, have opinions on whether this should be an opt-in or an opt-out. So I'll, I'll start, I guess. It, that's a tricky question. I, um, there, there are patient rights and, you know, people have the right to decide whether they're monitored it or not. However, um, especially for essential workers in, in, in areas where, where there's great risk to other people, um, there's plenty of precedent where you can require uh, certain types of surveillance and monitoring, uh, et cetera. So I, again, I'll go back to the food processing plant, it's a great example. Um, arguably, nursing homes are the same. A nursing home operator uh, should have the right to determine who has access to that facility because they're responsible for everyone in that facility. Uh, it's quite controversial whether the employees of that facility can be required to wear them. Um, what we're finding is that most want to be uh, monitored because they have their own families and kids that they want to make sure that they're um, identifying risk early and, and uh, you know, if they're identified to be at risk that they, they take the proper precautions. Uh, so it's, it's a tough issue. You've got a lot of new ground likely to be covered with HIPAA and privacy on the medical side. Um, but I do think there are going to be some areas where, where there's plenty of precedent where it can be required. Um, but others on the call probably have more, more insight to that than I. Any other panelists like to tackle that question? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess dovetailing with some of the questions coming from the audience here, uh, do we see this application being used beyond COVID for other diseases or conditions that impact vulnerable populations? What's, what's sort of the future path, the roadmap uh, for that? What's next? Well, so I'll, I'll chime in real quickly again. Our clinical team absolutely sees that. Uh, they, they really view this as infectious disease broadly and generally. Uh, that there's going to be um, application well beyond COVID, uh, especially as the functionality continues to expand and you can get heart rate and respiratory rate and other, other uh, biometric data coming in at the same time. Yeah, I'll just add uh, one, one small point on that. I, I think this is a new way to take temperature. I think as we go into the 21st century, you know, everything's going to be smart and interconnected. So that's sort of the thread that connects everybody on on this panel is we're all going to be working together in different solutions outside of healthcare as well. But uh, everybody having their own personal physiological baseline 
that's going to be a two-way interaction with your healthcare provider. In the days of just showing up the doc's office once a year, taking a bunch of vitals, and that's a one one every twelve month snapshot on on your body. That's that's going to be in the past. You're gonna you're gonna have whether it's AI on your device, so it never even gets sent anywhere, or if it's you know only shared on an opt-in basis with your with your doctor. Uh, you, the the way medicine is going to change because of this, I think, is it, we're going to look back at this as the days when they used to put leeches on people, you know, because we're going to just have such personalized visibility into your health. Yeah, first, I'm very excited by the prospects that uh, this may help set precedents for in terms of being able to apply the technology to a broader array of things. Uh, for instance, we saw with the cough data that uh, not only can this be useful for markers of COVID uh, from the cough, but also for uh, bronchitis and for pneumonia and other things. Certainly, we see that with e uh, EKG electrode data and being able to detect, you know, elevated ST segments and things that have been looked at from a, a cardio perspective, but uh, have always been a, a bit of a challenge from, uh, you know, a diagnostic device and the precedent with, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic uh, rules with FDA. So uh, at a necessity, what we see here with COVID might set precedents for, you know, the, the vast you know, opportunity beyond uh, the current crisis and we'll, time will tell, right? But uh, technically, certainly these things are all very possible. I would just add to that as we talk to, to varieties of. So oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say as we talk to varieties of different customers, where we're you know helping them to develop and manufacture the solutions, we're seeing more and more sensor requirements as we see expansion of of IoT. And I think what's really important here is that this this pandemic of today has really changed our behaviors. It changes. It's changed how we go to the doctors. But now with you know as Chris was just saying, as we have more sensors and more ability to understand what's going on, we can enable those doctors with more information while they're treating us remotely and such. And so the behaviors are changing and we're certainly seeing such an expansion around, you know, just the IOT space in general, um, not only with, with wearables, but with, with so many other things that I just think that, you know, this is, this is really driving a behavior change and a much more accepting of people knowing that they're getting secure sensors that are going to help them live a, a a richer life, basically. Mm -hmm. Dr. Armand, I think you were just wanted to add, yes. yes, so um, at AF Life, actually, even before COVID, the motivation for this starting the project into this was to to push the transition from the reactive healthcare to preventive healthcare and from the continual mon monitoring to a continuous monitoring. So that's one thing. And se secondly, I think we can bisect this question into two parts. One is related to pandemics and one is related to the regular non-pandemic diseases. For pandemics, just like any emergency, let it be tsunamis or everything, we have a early warning system, but unfortunately we don't have warning system for pandemics. We have witnessed a pandemic, several pandemics in the last decade. So a system like this, where we can measure multiple biomarkers at population level, cost effectively, non-intrusively, remotely, that can actually be used to even detect the emergence of pandemic before it becomes pandemic. So this is uh, one idea, I think, which will, be, will gain momentum and which we are pushing for. And the second is that uh, preventive healthcare, where we as Brian said that we won't have to we don't have to wait for the to visit doctor office every 12 months we can be continually be monitoring our biomarkers and dozens of biomarkers actually can be uh, detected uh, with smart sensors and watches and rings um, we can wear and which can give a clue to the new diseases for example we can even detect potassium level uh, in the blood using the pulse rate, uh, which can be made from a ring. Uh, so that that is a totally new era where we are entering into healthcare. Most more more of a, yes. And what, one thing that just struck me was I look at this data and hear about this. I can I can see this as being used as a good predictor that the temperature if you're converging on you know getting COVID or having COVID. Um, how 
how ahead of time do you have to be wearing this and actually getting that baseline temperature? Because what we're talking about here is sort of deltas to your personal baseline, right? Not not absolute temperature. How 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 many data samples? How many days? How many weeks should you really be wearing this to get that baseline uh, so that you can actually detect those those deltas? I'm not sure if that was included in the research or or not. Yeah, those are the kind of questions that we're answer you know answering with this multi site I mean, this is going to be in hundreds of facilities. Um, the short answer in in sort of the preclinical stuff that we've done is, you know, one to two days. You really need about it depends on the resolution. So like how many times are you measuring this today? Um, the way we, you know, do it now is just like, if it's three times a day, then at what point in the day are you measuring? Um, that is also significant. Um, I don't know if there are any oncologists on the call, but you know, there, people are starting to play around when you give chemo during the day and there's a lot of different research on that because your body, you know, at different points of the day have different metabolism. So, it really depends on the resolution, but obviously the more data, the better is the simple answer. Right. By the way, a couple of questions coming in here from the, the, the folks. Uh, one to comment, Brian, you're just, your last one there is that uh, this seems like a perfect wearable for oncology patients undergoing chemo. I don't know if there's any thoughts on that, comments from the panel. Yeah, I mean, in the past, the temperature sensing market was really like for continuous temperature sensors, mostly women's health and fertility. So that 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 was a market where um, people were used to understanding the the importance of um, establishing a baseline and seeing your rhythms. Uh, I think as we go into the future, uh, cert, you know, post pre and post op. Uh, chemotherapy. I mean, there, it's it's a whole new branch of medicine. Maybe Mark, you can take that since you know those are the call. Those are the type of stuff that you've worked on with uh, with Stefan over at Brown. Uh, I, I think you. I think you covered it. I, th I think that's that's exactly right. Um, I, again, I'm not a clinician, so I, I defer to others on the call. But the the idea that you can use real-time continuous monitoring for temperature, especially correlated with the other biometrics uh, in remote patient monitoring is huge. One thing that I don't know if we've covered enough though is one of the nice things about this approach is that the device doesn't require a battery. It, that that, that the, the, the data is, you know, the, the, the chip itself is long lasting. We don't have to replace it every 30 days and that you're able to get that data um, from the energy from, uh, Brian, you were showing your phone earlier, but from the reader itself. Um, and it might be interesting for those of you on the engineering side to kind of describe how that works because from a healthcare perspective, that makes life a lot easier uh, and a lot um, simpler to maintain and support. Yeah, and if, if I'd like to add to that last point, Mark, for the rest of the panelists to address is, sort of when do we see this going into, you know, the masses from availability point of view? And then the other, I guess, related topic is that some of the most at-risk people uh, sometimes tend to be the most um, challenged technologically. So how, how easy is it for them to actually use this and be comfortable with, with using this? Again, outside of the, the nursing home where you kind of have nurses to administer some of these things. Uh, Mike, you're on mute. Yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, if I could just chime in quickly. So the technology is near field communication. We also have technology that can use uh, UHF, which is longer uh, far field technology, as some people call it, um, up to 30 or 40 meters. They use this technology quite often in, um, you know, just basic uh, um, uh, Amazon types of situations where you're looking for um, uh, understanding what products you have, you know, what quantities and so forth like that. So ju just general information about something. So putting it on a human body, um, we're using the same technology that comes in a phone today. So we all, in most of the new phones in the last couple of years, we have uh, an NFC button in there. You just go find it. You can, you know, scan this device. Um, for facilities and things, we can also build an NFC reader. Uh, we can also build a UHF reader. So there are different methods and different ways. We could also use Bluetooth. We could also use Wi-Fi. So there's all kinds of different things that looking for, um, looking into the future and a roadmap, as someone suggested earlier, 
uh, there are plenty of things for us to, to use to sort of get into this trend of telehealth. And um, as Brian eloquently said, understanding um, your physiology, the more data, the better. So if I can take readings three, four times a day, and then I have a dashboard that shows all of my health data to my doctor, you can sort of see transitions and blips and, and things, uh, and then hopefully you can correlate them to not just COVID, but flus, other, uh, you know, things. And pregnancy is a good one, um, chemotherapy. Anyway, this is uh, from the technical side of things. It's all built on a very mature technology, which is RF technology that's in, a, in employment today. So we can kind of build on what's been, you know, um, established over many years of, of, and putting a reader right into a cell phone. If I could just jump in, Brian, you know, this is a really, really important point. None of what we're talking about is new tech. Like it's, it's stuff that's been around for, I mean, Mike's been in the wearable space for how long, Mike? Took 20? 20, 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So this isn't, what's new is when coronavirus hit, everyone on this call got together and say, how can we roll something quickly? End to end, we had 50 million ASICs into the, into the fab by, uh, you know, in a six month turnaround time. Now, part of that was pivoting from a, a design that was already in the works for a automotive setting, but to be able to do something that is very low cost with a near field communication reading. And I didn't even know much about NFC, but you know, if you go on Amazon, you can buy rolls and rolls and rolls of NFC stickers. You stick it to your garage door and you can put your phone and open your garage door. So, you know, NFC is not, it's really low tech. Um, what's new is then taking that and combining it with a custom chip. And that's what working with Skywater and, and, and Linear ASIC we were able to do. So I think that's really the future of medicine is how do you incorporate that into your everyday life um, with technology that's not going to scare people or need a battery or people have to worry about privacy, all that type of stuff. Because I'm telling you, everything we're gonna be in our home, on our chair, in our desk, is gonna be connected in some way um, and, and spitting out volumes and volumes and volumes of data. Yeah, totally agree with that, Brian. And I think uh, in some ways, there's nothing like a pandemic to sort of push people into that, you know, beyond that that comfort zone. I think a lot of us, when we hear about the anxiety from the security aspects and whether it's going to work, but this is sort of forcing us to, to move in that direction, which I think is the right thing. Um, any other closing comments from the rest of the panelists? We're getting up to the top of the hour here, and I want to come back to some of the questions that are being posed in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, uh, so moving to some of these questions. Um, is there a long tail to combine or give anonymized input data research gathered from these, these uh, trials and, and cases to provide to genetic research giants like 23andMe or Ancestry.com to identify markers more broadly that might create preventative signals to high-risk groups in the future. I mean, the answer is yes, if no one's going to take it. <laughs> there, uh, yeah, I mean, we're just, you know, confidentially, uh, like as I was saying before, um, we've, you know, the therapeutics industry and the and biotech industry itself, so it's not necessarily 23 and me, but the companies that are working really hard on therapeutics, uh, you know, look, I, I mean, I think we've, we've gone through one phase where we just dropped a, a, a bunker buster on everything. And now we're moving to the phase where we're doing smart, smart bombs. So, you know, if you're looking at this as a, as a something that, you know, binds to ACE2 and causes your hypertension, you know, people with pre-existing conditions of hypertension. So that's not genetic. Um, excuse me. Um, that's not genetic, but it is something that is uh, you know, in the works. Yeah, this next question, I think is actually, it's, it is interesting. And, and one on my mind is, uh, have any large health systems signed on to the test? Uh, great, phenomenal job guys. Now the challenge, and I think this gets to the heart of this is getting MDs to pivot as rapidly as, as you all have 
in uh, in getting this to market. To some extent, that's you know behavior change is getting people comfortable adopting new solutions. Um, where are we with that? How do you see that rolling out? What needs to happen for MDs to get comfortable? So um, we just signed a contract actually with the state of Massachusetts uh, to surveil roughly 100 group homes for uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Very similar to nursing homes, they're in a, you know, a congregate setting, they're a very high risk, vulnerable population. Uh, they People who get COVID in a group home tend to go to the hospital at a rate five times the general public. So it's a real problem. And the uh, state of Massachusetts Department of Developmental Services has asked us to deploy this solution. And we've partnered with a research foundation uh, that's going to help uh, collect the data and analyze the outcomes uh, of that program. And just adding to that, uh, you know, there, there's several health systems that are, are um, going to begin testing it device I and mean, quick, the quickest way to get people to pivot is just to prove it out. So we're working with Brown University to rapidly test this uh, across three facilities uh, this month, 12 states next month, and then sort of by uh, you know mid-November, try to get it into every nursing home in the country. Obviously, as data is coming out of those studies that we will be publishing other you know, whether it's the AMA or the hospital association or different groups, um, they uh, uh, will pick this up and look at that data and, and hopefully that will change some minds. Uh, another question coming in here on the line. Does it make sense if a proximity sensor is also integrated to provide social distancing cues? And I guess to some extent, maybe that even feeds into how would this integrate or not with uh, contact tracing. There are several sensor suites that we've been looking at. We sort of have a, a list and a, and a chart, a matrix of different sensors. Proximity is definitely one of them. And then, and then a host of other sensors that we've uh, either been asked or, or we've kind of come up with our own list. And that's sort of the work to be done, but absolutely it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense proximity. Um, and, and some of those things are available right now with your cell phone. So we can take the data from the proximity of your cell phone and include uh, proximity and contact tracing algorithms that are already out there. So those are things that we'll be um, putting into the system uh, with existing data and existing sensors, but then we have a suite of sensors that we have on our roadmap as well. The answer is it kind of automatically does contact tracing in a way because every time you tap this thing, you'll get the, lo as Mike was saying, the location data from your phone. It depends on if people opt in to use it. And then if there's someone else, whether it's a, a designated state entity or a school system or whatever um, that gets um, members to opt into something like that, that's, that's the real question. But that data is always there and available you know, on your phone. Once you, once you tap that tag, then it sets up an, a, an event and we could use that to do contact tracing. Right. Uh, another question coming in, and we'll probably just have to wrap it up after that since we are at the top of the hour. Uh, how will the solution help to detect other illness symptoms such as pneumonia from coughs? Chris of Sensible and Dr. Hebron. Yeah, in the data sets that we've seen so far, uh, we've been able to do correlations not only to COVID, but also to uh, other uh, uh, conditions, as you mentioned. So uh, the, the data seems promising. Obviously, our focus with this particular effort has been in uh, the correlation and positive predictivity for COVID-19. But uh, we do see that in the the results from uh, the looking at the uh, analysis of the training data sets. Dr. Irma, do you have any feedback on that question? Yes, so and it is possible, it depends on the, on the training data. And uh, for most respiratory diseases, actually we have an already analyzed, at least five of them can be diff differentiated from COVID-19, but uh, we will need more data to definitely say that if it could be, a, um, if the COVID-19 pattern is unique, but it, it is 
distinct from most commonly existing respiratory diseases which cause coughs. For example, pertussis, bronchitis, and uh, uh, um, uh, crop and, uh, and bronchiolitis. So these five diseases we have already investigated. And pneumonia in itself is not a disease. So pneumonia can be caused by bacterial or, or viral infection or even um, COVID-19 infection. So um, and is this uh, app we have designed uh, capable to differentiate pneumonia caused by COVID-19 from pneumonia caused by a bacterial infection? The answer is yes. Great, thanks. Okay, I think uh, where we are with the time, I'd like to just open it up for the panelists to have any closing remarks for the audience um, as far as where you are, where the solution is, um, any other observations you'd like to share before we wrap it up? And we can start uh, with the same order, perhaps, uh, Brian? You're on mute. Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, closing re remark would be this is stuff that's, you know, available today. So we, we've, we've you know, bit our tongue and, and been in the garage getting this all together and now we have it at scale. Um, it, it's not, uh, it's in the clinic, you know, being tested as a, an approved medical device, but with the FDA exemption as a, a temperature sensor, um, you know, that we can, we can sell this at scale into the market. And that's certainly our goal is to get as many of these out, out there. So this, this panel is actually one of the first where we're saying, hey, this is, this is available and, and uh, you know, taking ideas and collaborators and how we can help with this mission. Thanks, Brian. Mark? Yeah, I think, I think what we're doing is really important and the idea of integrating these various technologies into remote patient monitoring and surveillance is gonna be uh, more and more important in the wave of the future. In addition to the technology and in addition to the clinical outcomes, one of the things that's gonna be important over the next six months is using the, you know, collecting the data that makes the, you know, the clinical and business case uh, so that these services are coded and reimbursable, uh, you know, through Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial plans. There, there's arguments to be said today that, you know, we are able to leverage with some of the waivers under the, you know, the current administration, um, waivers for remote patient monitoring, et cetera, that allow us to, to uh, deliver the service and get paid. And I think those things need to be made permanent. So I think that will become important as, as we go forward. Mark? Yeah, I, I would just say from our perspective, you know, kind of following on Brian's point that the technologies exist, and much of the technology we use from a manufacturing perspective, uh, our, our very uh, traditional state-of-the-art proven technology platforms, it's the innovation piece and in that there are options to innovate, come up with new solutions uh, here in the U.S. that are going to be safe and secure. And, and that's what we're seeing people driving to is they want to bring together more and more of these different, you know, sensors, uh, which drive the data, which enable, you know, those decisions and behavioral changes to happen. So, you know, it, it's here and it's now and it, it's not about invention as much as it's about really just iterating and moving fast and, and partnering with customers from that perspective. Thanks, Mark. Mike? Yeah, I'd just like to close by saying I think this has been a great collaborative effort between the parties here and then a, a lot of other people, uh, including Brown University and the, and the healthcare systems. And so um, I, I just really want to say thank you to Mark Treat and Upward Health and Brian Whisk and, and all of the people that they've brought, you know, to this collaboration. Um, Skywater for just massively shoving wafers through the foundry so that we have uh, scale and, and, and volume and uh, um, sensible. I mean, th this is a great platform for um, doing AI for any kind of sensor information. You want to um, sort of get in, uh, 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 a conclusion from, and I, I think this complete collaboration, including, you know, Dr. Imran and all of their inputs has it, been just a, a great thing. And I'd like to see more of this and I'm happy to keep going. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Dr. Imran? You're on mute. On I'm, mute. I'm mute. So I think this is a, a very exciting phase. I think COVID-19, uh, although it is a global tragedy, but this has triggered us to think about what 
is needed, which is moving from reactive care to preventive and proactive care. And under the umbrella of this consortium, actually, this is what uh, the team is trying to do. And uh, there's a lot more which can be achieved, not only in the context of COVID-19, but um, many other diseases, and which I think using the same existing technologies just is a matter of bringing them together and integrating them and presenting them in the market. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ramon. Chris? Yeah, I would just say that uh, from, from an AI perspective, I'm very excited by this because uh, we, we've already demonstrated with the data sets that we have on hand that the technology works and that it provides some real value in terms of a screening technology, but it's not a, a, a static uh, situation, right? As we begin to deploy the solution, not only will it have benefits in terms of the predictive values that it provides as a diagnostic tool, but also we're gathering, we're continuing to gather new data that is used uh, to uh, refine the models. And so it's not a you know sort of one-time thing. It's you know by nature definition of AI. It's a, it's a learning technology. So we'll, we'll continue to gather data as we deploy this. Uh, it'll address corner cases that might not have been visible in your in initial train and test data sets, and, and just you know continue to improve the the outcome and results coming from the technology. So um, looking forward to that next phase. The data shall set you free. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just close by uh, just a comment to myself before I thank everybody. I think as I talk to almost everybody in the world right now, when I have interactions with them, if you ask them a feeling question, how are you feeling right now? A lot of times the answer is anxiety. I'm feeling anxious because we don't know. We don't know if kids are going to go back to school and we're going to go back to the office if we're at risk and going outside. And I think the way that generally humans transform anxiety into hope is that you have data, you understand things, you build awareness, and you take action. And I'm really just excited to see right now and hear from the panelists and being part of this consortium, just seeing the action and the data-driven approach that everybody's taking. And we're on the cusp now of getting those things that Brian has on his wrist and in his phone out into the masses. And I think for me personally, that's going to drop my anxiety level, turn into more hope, and I hope the, the same for everybody on the panel, everybody watching today. So great job to everybody on the panel. I'd like to thank the ACG for hosting this, putting it together, um, the panelists, and then, of course, there is no panel if there aren't participants uh, listening and taking busy time out of their busy day to participate. So I, I appreciate the engagement, the questions that came in, and if we didn't address your questions, please reach out afterwards to ACG and Yvonne who's back there again. And uh, again, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to you, Yvonne. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, fantastic discussion, conversation. Really appreciated all the information that was shared today. I am sure that everyone enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for taking the time to explain things to us. And uh, thank you for everyone joining us. And uh, we'll see you soon at one of the events of ACG Silicon Valley. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.